Hello, everybody. Welcome to History of Money. Professor Barth here, history professor at Arizona State University. All right. Lecture number 35. Man, we're really close to the end of the course. Part A, the Bretton Woods system. Part B, the dilution of the dollar in the 1950s and 1960s. And Part C, the Nixon shock, the closing of the gold window in 1971. All right. So, Second World War erupts in 1939. Of course, the U.S. doesn't join until the end of 1941. But in the months and two years leading up to that, the U.S. is already begin to, beginning to ramp up its munitions manufacturing through the Lend-Lease program. And it's really the end of World War, or it's really World War II that ends the Great Depression. All right. Uh, you know, if FDR had been, uh, if his term as president had ended in 1938 or 1939, his new deal would have been, you know, would have been seen as predominantly a failure, right? Good faith effort. But the fact of the matter was unemployment was, you know, still over 15% by the end of the 1930s. The stock market was still very low and it just didn't seem to have worked. We were still in the depression and, you know, you're already toward the end of, uh, of FDR's second term. Well, the world war breaks out and that changes everything. Uh, the U S becomes a manufacturing just powerhouse. Two thirds of all military equipment that were used by the allies combined were produced in the U S and look at all the ammunition, the, uh, machine guns, artillery pieces, warplanes, armor cars, tanks, naval ships, and all the fact the factories, the munitions factories. Some photographs from from the era. All of that wartime production. It's absolutely unprecedented output of 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 munitions and armaments there's a naval yard in boston women in the workplace as many of the men were overseas fighting the war and look at that unemployment rate so yeah there's the late 1930s we're still at 20 percent shoot you know 1940 comes along we're still over 15 percent even by the beginning of 1941 you still have double digit unemployment by 1942 we're down to basically zero unemployment so this changes everything the uh real gdp or increases in in gdp look at that 17.7 percent in 1940 and then if you were to extend this graph in 1941 and in 1942 you're looking at 18 20 percent increase in GDP within that year. So just incredible numbers, never seen anything like it before. Of course, it was very costly. This is all government spending, federal spending. Look at the, the amount of federal spending during the Second World War, approaching 100% of uh, the nation's GDP. You look at, uh, this was federal debt held by the public as a percentage of gross domestic product. There's a great, the New Deal, there's World War II. So a huge increase in spending. The money supply takes off. There's 1940 was right here. So already quite a big in, increase from 1933 to 1940 in the money supply and then further increases in the early 40s to finance all this war construction. By the end of World War II, the U.S. is the economic powerhouse and, and economically dominant with no real uh, competition. Um, in fact, American arms production by 1942 was double that of Germany, Italy, and Japan combined. Double that amount. At the end of World War II, the U.S. was producing one half of the world's manufactured goods. Think about that. One half of the world's manufactured goods produced by the United States. The U.S., unlike the nations in Europe, was untouched by the war, the, the land that is, and so you didn't have the wartime destruction and instability that these other countries suffered. So the U.S. has emerged a leading industrial, monetary, and military power. And then on top of that, the U.S. Treasury, 
by the end of the war possessed almost two-thirds of the world's gold reserves. 65% of the world's gold reserves were held by the U.S. Treasury. Now, after 1933, private gold possession within the United States was illegal, so this is held by the Treasury. Now, it's two-thirds. Think about that. Total U.S. gold reserves actually peaked in 1941 at 651 million ounces, which amounted to just over 20,000 tons of gold. 20,000 tons of gold, or to state it differently, 40,000 pounds of gold held by the U.S. And why, why, how did this happen? Such a reversal from earlier. Well, all that manufacturing out manufacture all those manufactured goods all that output exported overseas u.s was running big trade surpluses and also the u.s treasury is buying gold at 35 dollars an ounce which which at the time was a really a bargain price if you were selling gold 35 dollars an ounce was a high price the u.s treasury had been buying gold at 35 dollars an ounce since january of 1934 Formerly, gold was priced at $20.67 an ounce. Then FDR re, uh, revalued gold, made it $35 an ounce. After that, a lot of people brought their gold to the United States, sold it to the Treasury for $35. That was uh, quite, quite the deal. And so the U.S. has a, a ton of gold. And the bulk of it, majority of it, they stored at the uh, U.S. Bullion Depository at Fort Knox, which is located in Kentucky. And to this day, Fort Knox, a uh, heavily, heavily fortified vault, uh, contains more than half of the uh, of the nation's gold reserves. So the U.S. government still owns a lot of gold. U.S. Treasury today owns about uh, just over 8,000 tons of gold. We're the, we own more gold than any country in the world. Second place is Germany at 3,371 tons. And the majority of that gold is still kept at Fort Knox. The theory was, hey, put it in Kentucky, deep in the inland, uh, as opposed to a coast where an invader could, could more easily access it. Nobody's getting into, into Fort Knox. So, wow, quite a, quite a change from, from the depression of the 1930s. The U.S. honestly has enough gold at this point to... to the option is there if they wanted to exercise it. The ability is there to return to a classical gold standard, right? Uh, not just a weak link gold standard, but a full-on gold standard with gold coins, gold redemption for ordinary Americans. That could have happened after World War II. There was enough gold to support that system. That is not the, the route that the U.S. went. And we have to ask ourselves, why? Why wouldn't you go that way? Well, Two reasons. One, uh, gold places a restraint, a pretty strict restraint, a firm restraint on currency creation, on monetary authorities. And by the 1940s, uh, this was frowned upon by leading economists who believed that John Maynard Keynes had been vindicated, that Keynes had won the debate against, against Hayek. And you'll remember Last lecture, we talked about Keynes and Hayek, and Keynes emerged a victor out of that debate. And what was Keynes all about? Deficit spending, right? Borrowing money, central banks intervening through monetary stimulus. You can't have gold in a system like that. Gold doesn't work in a Keynesian economic system. Monetary authorities in the 1940s and afterwards wanted, desired a great degree of flexibility to be able to create currency at will. Then the other reason, the United States, by the end of the war, very much wishes to, to construct a new international monetary order that is dollar-centric, where the U.S. dollar is, is the, at the forefront of, of this new international monetary system based around the dollar and for that to happen you know you're not going to want to return to a back to a classical gold standard so in may of 1944 the united states invited all the allied nations to come to Bretton woods new hampshire in july and to to convene at the mount washington 
Hotel. Conference began on July 1st, 1944, and lasted about three weeks through July 22nd. Now you'll notice the date there, World War II is still going on, but this is just after D-Day, and, and, and the momentum is on the side of the Allied powers. And so the, the agenda at this conference, okay, what's the, what's the international order, the monetary order, going to look like after the war is over, all right? Because prior to World War II in the 1930s, it was a decade of, you know, what you could call, you could say currency warfare, where you had different na nations competitively devaluing their currencies one against another in order to gain an advantage in trade. And, and it, it was a, a, a system that had broke, it broke down after, you know, during the Great Depression. And there was a consensus that you need some sort of structure and stability, some sort of negotiated monetary agreement between all the different allied nations. And so that is exactly what they, what they discussed and decided upon. 44 allied nations met at Bretton Woods, 730 delegates, to construct a new international monetary order. The product was the Bretton Woods system. And this Bretton Woods system lasted for a quarter of a century from 1944 through 1971. There's a lot we could say about the Bretton Woods system. It's a very complicated, complex system. So we'll just boil it down to its, its most important points. A dollar centric international monetary order. Only the US dollar was convertible into gold. So that's the only currency, national currency, that would be com directly convertible into gold. Gold. Now you could take any currency and go on the open market and buy gold, buy and, you know, buy and sell gold with that currency. But as far as you know, the government converting that currency into, into gold, that's only true for the US dollar and it'll be at $35 an ounce, the rate that was established by FDR in 1934. But not just anybody can, can redeem dollars for gold only foreign central banks so only foreign central banks may redeem dollars for gold under this system now what about the currencies of other countries well foreign central banks for their part held u.s dollars in reserve and then pegged their own national currencies to those dollars Okay, so foreign central banks used U.S. dollars as their reserve base currency to then back their own national currencies with each national currency pegged to the gold-backed dollar. And because they were all pegged to the gold-backed dollar, that meant you had, or that resulted in, fixed exchange rates. Fixed exchange rates between national currencies from 1944 to 1971. So today we have what are called floating exchange rates, meaning, you know, at any time you could go online and see, well, what is the, the, the exchange rate between a dollar and a Japanese yen? What is the exchange rate between a dollar and a Swiss franc? What's the exchange rate between a dollar and a pound or the dollar and a euro? And, and it changes by the hour because they are floating rates. Between 1944 and 1971, they were fixed rates the dollar became the anchor currency of the entire international monetary order, or stated differently, the world's reserve currency. The world's reserve currency held by reserve, held on reserve, in reserve, excuse me, by other foreign central banks to back and to support their own currencies. Most ma major currencies were pegged to the dollar. And countries, Various countries settled their international accounts in dollars. So if you had two, two countries and they needed to settle you know, a balance of payments between those two countries, even if the United States was not involved in that economic transaction, the dollar was used as the, as the accounting currency to, to settle that balance. So the dollar in essence took over the role that gold used to play. The dollar took over the role internationally that gold used to play by becoming, by becoming the world's reserve currency. Now, because it was the world's reserve currency and because foreign central banks supported their national currencies with these U.S. dollars in reserve, 
there was at first a disincentive for foreign central banks to present their dollars to the U.S. government for gold because you want to keep your dollars in reserve to support your currency. So long as the dollar didn't lose value. The dollar began to lose value and it was clear that the dollar was worth a lot less than gold at this price. Then that's going to change the whole ballgame. That happens in the 1960s. In the 1960s, foreign central banks are going to figure out that the dollar can no longer support gold at this price. And at that point, they began presenting their dollars for gold redemption. But in the early days, they don't want to present their dollars for gold redemption because the dollar was worth more than gold. And the dollar is what, what supported their national currencies. John Maynard Keynes attended the conference and was the chief representative of the British Treasury. There he is pictured with Harry Dexter White, who is the Secretary of the Treasury for the, representing the U.S. And Keynes didn't like this idea at all. He wanted to uh, create a new international currency called the Bancor, B-A-N-C-O-R, that would be used as the international unit of account, uh, the unit of accounting between nations, and, and, would, uh, and would be exchangeable with national currencies at a fixed rate. His proposal was shot down. The U.S. overrode it. This conference was on U.S. turf. The U.S. is the economic powerhouse, and so they had uh, uh, the upper hand in that debate. The Soviet Union also attended uh, the, the meeting, but, but left, walked out of the meeting because they felt it was too U.S. friendly. They also claimed that the IMF and World Bank, which we'll get to in a second, which were created by the Bretton Woods um, conference, that the IMF and the World Bank were, quote, branches of Wall Street. And so they refused to ratify the agreement. So the dollar is, dollar is king. All other currencies pegged to it. And, and even though there was, you know, you have fixed exchange rates, the, each country had a little bit of wiggle room, like 1%. They could go plus or minus 1% that, that fixed exchange rate. But they had to remain within that, that parity. And, and the dollar was supported the entire the entire system. New York City was the financial capital of the world, undis indisputed. London is no longer the financial capital. New York City, and look at all those skyscrapers there. Now, London climbs back in the 1970s and 1980s. And to this day, London and New York are are pretty close but after immediately after world war ii it was no contest new york city was ahead all that gold at fort knox now two institutions were created under the Bretton Woods system as a result of this conference the imf and the world bank now a lot could be said about both of these organizations i'll just state it very quickly and, and we'll move on but the IMF was created in order to ensure that countries that had severe trade imbalances, trade deficits, could remain within their, their proper parity, their fixed exchange rate, by borrowing money from the IMF to, to meet that trade imbalance. Today, even though we have floating exchange rates, IMF, still functions as a, an institution that loans money to countries with severe financial problems. So financial instability, emergency, huge budget deficits, huge uh, trade deficits, anything of the like, the IMF is, uh, still exists to lend those countries money. The World Bank was slightly different. The World Bank existed to lend, or, and still exists, to lend money to developing countries for infra primarily for infrastructure projects. Now, initially, the World Bank consisted only of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And this International Bank for Reconstruction and Development primarily lent money to the European powers and to Japan for rebuilding their countries after the war. After the 1940s and 1950s, the World Bank expanded 
its uh, mandate to also include loaning money to uh, poorer nations, lower income nations for infrastructure projects. And the branch of the World Bank that deals with poor nations is the International Development Association. The World Bank comprises both of those, both of those associations. Both of these institutions were, uh, were and remain based, headquartered in Washington, DC. And that is one of the criticisms of, of these institutions. Uh, both the World Bank and in the United States are run by a very small number of, of economically powerful countries. Those are the countries that provide most of the, the institution's funding. They choose the leadership and the management and they run the, they run the show. Another criticism of the IMF and World Bank is policy called conditionality or structural adjustment, where conditions are attached to loan provisions. So, you know, uh, if you are a country and you need to borrow money from either the IMF or the World Bank, you may be asked to, uh, to liberalize your markets, right, to open up trade to uh, multinational corporations. If you have a minimum wage, maybe it's too high. Maybe you need to lower that minimum wage a little bit. Maybe you need to deregulate your economy, especially with, with respect to uh, 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 outside corporations coming in. Um, and a, a, whole, a whole range of different, different conditions that are often attached to those loan provisions. And the criticism there is that the IMF and the World Bank essentially violate those countries' national sovereignty. That how can you say these countries are truly sovereign if, if the institutions they're buying, they're loaning from, are telling them the different policies they are and aren't allowed to adopt? For example, some, uh, even though it may seem unrelated, there have been times where the IMF and the World Bank have required borrowing countries to allow GMOs, GMO crops, into their countries. Some countries have banned GMOs because they believe. GMOs are dangerous. Well, there have been cases where the IMF and the World Bank says, hey, look, if you want this loan, you're going to need to allow GMOs uh, or you're going to need to allow this corporation to move into your to set a plant into your country, even if you don't necessarily want it. Now that you have this loan. Or if you want to lower the interest payment on your current loans, you have to you have to abide by. By their conditions. This is also sometimes known as the Washington Consensus. The Washington Consensus, both the IMF and the World Bank are headquartered in Washington, D.C. The Washington Consensus was a post-World War II consensus among these leading economic institutions, international institutions, supporting free trade, meaning no trade barriers between different nations, like protective tariffs, so no protective tariffs, globalization, economic consolidation into... Uh, into different regional blocks like NAFTA or the TPP or the European Union, reducing regulations on multinationals, privatization, budgetary tightening, all of that makes up the so-called Washington Consensus. And one of the leading organizations in this Washington Consensus is a think tank called the Council on Foreign Relations or the CFR. CFR is still a one of the more powerful think tanks in Washington, D.C. It was actually established in New York City in 1921 in the post-World War I era. And its agenda from the beginning was to promote a, a, an internationalist agenda uh, based pretty closely on this, on this so-called Washington Consensus. Membership in the uh, CFR has included many um, Top figures in U.S. politics. This include top politicians, more than a dozen secretaries of state, the Clintons, CIA directors, bankers, lawyers, professors, senior media figures. Um, the CFR aims to to shape and to mold public opinion and to steer public policy making, really in in, in this direction. All right. And uh, during World War II, actually, the CFR conducted a major policy initiative on America's role in the peace. And they wanted America to be on the forefront internationally and to really run the world stage. The Rockefeller Foundation 
provided $350,000 to fund that project on deciding what is America's role in the peace going to be. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, uh, funding the CFR to conduct that to conduct that project. But members of the CFR have been in, uh, all over different presidential administrations, both Democrat and Republican. The Truman and during the Truman administration, 42 percent of the top posts were filled by CFR members. During Eisenhower, 40 percent. During Kennedy, 51 percent. During Lyndon B. Johnson's administration, administration 57 percent. Uh, the Bushes, the Clintons, and even President uh, Presidents Obama and 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 even President Donald Trump had CFR members uh, uh, feature pretty prominently in their administrations. Former chairs of the CFR have included sitting board members of J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, and the current chair of the CFR is David Rubenstein, who is who is the co-founder and CEO of the Carlyle Group which is a multinational equity investment company. So again, big, big ties here to global finance and uh, very, very important. One of those groups you don't hear a lot about, but exercises a lot more power than you would think as a, as a think tank in steering public policy. And it's both Democrats and Republicans, irrespective of party. One of the most uh, powerful figures in a CFR was David Rockefeller, pictured there here. David Rockefeller was the uh, grandson of John D. Rockefeller and a grandson of Nelson Aldrich, who was the Jekyll Island attendee, as you will recall. David Rockefeller was uh, chairman and chief executive of Chase Manhattan Bank. Uh, Chase Manhattan later merged with J.P. Morgan in 2000, in the year 2000, to become J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, David Rockefeller uh, made a ton of money financing the oil industry, especially ExxonMobil. Um, under his leadership, Chase Manhattan expanded internationally and became one of the, the central pillars of the world financial system. Um, David Rockefeller was a, an active member of the, of the Bilber, Bilderberg Group, which was established in 1954, a conference of elite uh, financial and uh, business corporate um, board members. Uh, the secrecy of the conference has, has uh, led to a lot of speculation and theorizing about what goes on there. Uh, but it's really just a meeting of, of elites coming up with policy, ag policy agendas that, that support that basic Washington, Washington consensus. Uh, David Rockefeller was also became, or excuse me, became director of the CFR in 1949. So David Rockefeller, Council on Foreign Relations in 1949 and onward. And then David Rockefeller in 1973 helped to establish the Trilateral Commission, which... Uh, uh, endorsed tight, close cooperation between Western Europe, the United States, and Japan on, on, on these different economic issues, again, revolving around the Washington Consensus. And David Rockefeller had very close relations with the Bushes and the Clintons. He actually lived to be 100 and over 100 years old. He was born in 1915 and only died very recently in 2017. But really, he was just big, big figure in this period. Really, you could say the face of the post-war international financial world order. So that is Bretton Woods, right? In a nutshell, and kind of the, and the forces behind it. There's Life Magazine, American flag, New York City, July second, nineteen forty-five. Ten cents. Ten cents. So the question in the next video is what happened to the dollar? What happened to the dollar? Because by the 1960s, you're not buying a magazine for 10 cents. What happened to the dollar? That'll be a subject of part B of our lecture. I'll see you there. Bye.